just who is the chump in the office episode the chump we got lots of candidates hey i'm chris and i'm reviewing every episode of the office ever and today we're looking at the penultimate episode of the office season six the chump let's go warning <laughs> warning warning i understand nothing a quick recap for those not following along. In the last episode, Michael found out that he was the other guy. It's you. I'm married. I'm the mistress? I'm gonna kill him. And in this episode, he reveals that he's on board for this affair. We're in the midst of a passionate love affair. Also, Dwight's trying to get out of his baby-making contract. Do you understand how rare that is in nature? And Jim and Pam are tired. That's a subplot. All right, the last few episodes have been kind of brief, uh, so indulge me in this episode as you've already clicked on it, you know this is gonna be a longer one. I think I could spend forever on this cold opening. Please don't throw these out. See them all over the office. <laughs> Especially the radon thing. This isn't the first time that this radon thing has come up in the series. I mean, we have radon coming from below, we have asbestos in the ceilings. These are silent killers. You are the silent killer, go back to the annex. You'll see. You say right on is silent but deadly, and then you expect me not to make farting noises with my mouth? What is this? Which is nice continuity, but is there a point to that continuity? No. The way the mind so easily references that moment during this cold opening, almost to say, hey, remember that time that Toby was really creepy? Is it a hidden way for the writers to seed in the idea of who the strangler is? <laughs> I mean, if you watch any of my stuff, Toby was not the Scranton Strangler. Many fans point to Toby as the Scranton Strangler, and while that is definitely not true, I could be redundant and just spout out some well-known theories about Toby being the Scranton Strangler, which he's not, then you know I don't. But let's check in with Paul Lieberstein. When you were writing the show and when you were acting in the show, did you ever did that ever cross your mind? No. It's a fun theory. I like thinking about it, talking about it, but the Strangler was just a grab bag, throwaway joke, that became then an in-joke in the series. But there is a totally different fan theory hidden underneath the surface of this cold opening. This is a radon test kit. Please don't throw these out. I talked about this in the second Lesser Known Theories video, which coincidentally has less views than the first and the third in the series, making it the Lesser Known, Lesser Known Office Theories video. You're welcome for that. Clever Mike. The theory is an attempt to understand the stress relief effect and the impact it's had on the series. You can go watch this video if you want a reminder on what the heck I'm talking about there. But in short, the series went from this. That's the thing I bought myself. I'm really psyched to use it. To this. <laughs> Shove it up your butt. I have to go to the bathroom. Where does it end with you people? But back to this cold opening, radon is a gas which emits from the earth, which is pretty harmless out in the open. But when it's trapped in a structure, like coming through your foundation, it can have some pretty devastating effects on our human bodies, including the brain. It is the foaming barking killer. So, you know, go watch that video for more if, you know, you kind of want a dark explanation for all the jolliness that happens throughout the latter half of the series. And hey, we're not even past the cold opening yet. We move straight from there into how you'd shoot three people, which makes a pretty funny bit. The whole two bullet thing is a red herring. Here's how you do it. You line them all up, you take one bullet, shoot them all through the throat at the same time. And because you guys are my therapy friends, and what are friends good for? Please, this is serious. This whole cold opening unlocked this core memory for me, and I can't find this movie for the life of me, but I swear it was like a Jonathan Taylor Thomas movie from the 90s, and these two mobsters are sitting in a car and they're staking out the good guys. There is no such thing as monsters. And they're talking about what kind of, I'm gonna say handhelds could finish off people. I wanna keep this video monetized. yippee ki mother. But they're like calculating stopping power and trajectories and different things like that in a kid's movie and I just remember being quite shocked by that. I'm gonna see if I can dig that up between today and whenever this video launches. No? No good? Well, it, I'm pretty sure it exists, people. If you know what I'm referring to, leave it in the comments. I feel like it may have been Man of the House with Chevy Chase. It reminds me a lot of The Three Amigos with Steve Martin and Chevy Chase. 
but I refuse to watch that entire movie. Curve the bullet like in my favorite James McAvoy film, uh, Wanted. McAvoy's come a long way from Wanted, which I, apparently is a great movie. I've never watched it. Uh, but what is your favorite James McAvoy movie? I'm going with Split. Right, and I just had to comment about this too. All that does is help you shoot around things. What does been lost? Is there a curtain rod in the room? What's Ryan's idea here? I don't know. Like, leave that in the comments. How about make believe land as anything you want? Fair warning, though, if you're too graphic, YouTube's gonna block your comment. I say, you know, you gotta be, I guess, creative in describing what Ryan might have been proposing. Boing, 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 boing. Kevin's got a lot of great one-liners in this where he's just standing across the bullpen and shouts something out. That is a dangerous game, friendo. I'm a fan. ah -ya. That's okay. Random. <laughs> Ryan's a total dirtbag in this episode. You're attractive and I want to sleep with you. What about Kelly? You read my mind. But this is actually a really deep callback to one of the webisodes. The Mentor, BFFs. I have been laying the groundwork for a threesome for some time now. It's so scuzzy. But speaking of trios, I feel like this. I'm really too tired to do this. Me too. Then let's just not do this. Do you have any idea of the risks involved? Hey, Michael. Hey. We were wondering if you'd like to have dinner with us tonight. Is a callback to their season four relationship. Uh, Michael. If the invitation still stands, Pam and I would love to have dinner tonight. Damn it to hell! I, okay. It also feels like this. That is something I would never do. Well, I think we all know what you're capable of, Meredith. It's also a callback to business ethics. Exchange of steak. Have you ever had sirloin steak, honey? And then we have the continuity callbacks like this. I'm a cuckold. For those of you unfamiliar with William Shakespeare, a cuckold is a man whose woman is cheating on him. I've lived the part. <laughs> and let me tell you, I would so much rather play the part on stage. And the contract. I'd like to see a stool sample. Dwight, look at my teeth. Oh. Now everyone, make a mental note of this, because you're going to want to check this out later. NBC actually released this entire contract in its redacted form. Redacted. Redacted. While we might not ever know what all was in the original contract, check this out when you have a second. It includes provisions on what would happen if the child's born with superpowers. Oh, I have a few powers. Night hearing. Dogs understand where I point. What should happen if the baby is born with one blue eye and one brown eye? And mandates about cats' placements above all other animals. On that topic, I haven't gushed about Kinsey in quite a while, uh, but she performs this line with precision. But not in your bed. It's Lumpy. Those lumps are cats, and those cats have names, and those names are Ember, Milky Way, Diane, and Lumpy. The whole contract thing's pretty great. I had to watch this several times for this review, and every time I was delighted by some other thing I'd missed in a previous watch through. I'm an adult male, but at heart, I'm still like a 12 year old boy. So I'm going to laugh when dudes get hit in the crotch. Grown fruit man. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, I think this sequence is fantastic. Fantastic. With such a great payoff. What did you do to yourself? Never mind. Just never mind. Well, it better work. Oh, it'll work. And that takes us to Jim and Pam. I don't have a lot to say about this mini plot, but I do know that it is now my life's goal to be talked about with such fondness as Daryl does that sleeping spot in the warehouse. Light bulbs burn out so it's dark. And the heat from the backup generator keeps it nice and warm. Sometimes I think about it when I'm trying to fall asleep at home. I do think John Krasinski's breaking character a little bit here. Surprisingly restrained. We will be well rested tomorrow. But on to Michael's story, and we're gonna get a lot more into it into the deeper meaning, but there's a lot of fun to be had while the staff is still trying to figure out if Michael's broke it off or not. So we're gonna say the most likely scenario is that Michael matured overnight? Well, it happened to Tom Hanks in Big. Exactly. It happened in Big. Michael turns down Billy Joel Rock Band with Jim and Pam. Billy Joel Rock Band. That exists? Yes. Okay, well, I'll have to take a rain check, but thanks for the offer. Which at the time of airing, did not exist. But it turns out that Joel was a fan of The Office. Just one more thing that Billy and I have in common. But he told his people to get this Billy Joel rock band thing going. You could actually still buy it right now. It's 20 bucks on PS4. Stop it. Stop. What is that? It's for the longest time by William Joel. And... This is the Office Field Guide, so for context, 
this was about a year late. I am declaring a moment of silence right now. 10 minutes of silence honoring Michael Jackson. Just sit there and think about Michael Jackson. And then I caught that I think Michael may have had a reason for this joke. Oh, Michael, will you drop it? Everybody's spoken their mind and no one's changing their mind. Okay, Morgan Freeman narrating everything. Well, because I am Michael Scarn. And this line is so sobering. Living with myself or being happy. And I picked the former. And we're gonna talk about that during the deeper meaning, so let's go. Let's go! Oh, God! Okay, come on, come on! What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. There's probably a lot of ways we could dissect this entire episode, but clearly the oomph of the whole thing is that sometimes what the heart wants isn't the right thing. Sometimes the heart doesn't know what it wants until it finds what it wants. Like that girl Precious and Precious, based on the novel Pushed by Sapphire. I didn't see that movie. No time is this more clear than when you're on a diet. All of a sudden, I want nothing but Hostess brownies and pizza. I thought you were gonna parcel those out through the day. Just stop it! You haven't done anything helpful all day. My birthday blows. Go on, baby, go on. He ate 40,000 calories in three hours. And my head says, hey, dude, maybe don't. But my body's like, telling me, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this concept is nothing new for sitcoms to explore. I have never been so repulsed by someone mentally and so attracted to them physically at the same time. It's like my brain is facing my penis in a chess game. Desperado. Witchy Womanilla. Why do they do this? We talked about cognitive dissonance way back in season three with the Ben Franklin episode. Cognitive dissonance. Dissonance is a fancy word for disharmony. When your actions don't match up with your beliefs, it can stress the crap out of you. Remember that, it's important. And now, coaching third base with two arms, two legs, and a heart capable of feeling okay. pain. All right, can you just number two? But the theory is that when we behave in a way that's inconsistent with our thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, worldview, whatever, it creates friction within us. That's what we see happening within Michael throughout this episode, which was written by the pickle guy, by the way. Of course, I'll get you a bowl of pickles. Thank you. Michael starts off this episode seemingly totally fine. Kick it to the limit, that's my favorite. I love that. But that's because he's already had his bout with the dissonance already. I asked Donna about this and she is fine with it. And just to be sure, I asked her again afterward, same answer. Michael's pretty rooted in his comfort level with his behavior in spite of his coworkers' thoughts. Here's the thing about infidelity. No. Feelings. Michael Scott, are you still seeing Donna? Pam, she's not invisible, so stop asking silly questions. And behavior. Phyllis, look at... He shifts the blame off himself. He even meets the husband face to face and shakes his hand, kind of, through a fence. But he likens his behavior then to James freaking Bond. James Bondfire. <laughs> I am Bondfire. James Bondfire. Michael Scott. <sighs> and then he decides to go full alpha. A motel is dirty and it is sexy. Like me. Nobody better try to stop me. Dog fighting, drugs. I am what I am, Oscar. And I want what I want. That's Popeye. I have got big balls. I have an appetite for life. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, God, that's lemon. So Michael's pretty entrenched in his thought process here. There's not a lot of cognitive dissonance happening. That's why I think this car scene is so well done. Krell is excellent at dramatic acting, and you can see his journey in his head as he moves through comfort to dissonance, leading to that gut-wrenching line. At the end of the day, you have to do what's right. And it was either living with myself or being happy. And that's because he probably remembered this. Secret secrets are no fun. Secret secrets hurt someone. That's freaking brilliant. How do you know that? Did you learn that on the streets? Michael comes to grips with who he's become and what he's doing, 
and that friction occurs, and the only thing he can do is right the wrongs. I wish existence on this rock was really simple. Who thought it would be hysterical to give Toby a rock? for his going away gift? And that things would just work out like they do in stories like comic books or, you know, old school TV, where there's good guys and there's bad guys and the good guys always win and bad is always punished and there's no grand, there's no struggle and there's no decisions to do the right thing that crush your hopes for the future. Maybe more than any other time in the series, I feel for Michael in his decision here because it's made by himself for himself. And that's a tough thing to do. So while I don't contone adulterizing people, I do tip my hat to him. What a meaty episode. Michael Scott? Yes? Do you want to make a comment on the rumors? And yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So let's rate this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> okay, cold opening. Honestly, I think this is where it's at. It hits almost all of my marks for good cold opening. It's energetic, it has the whole staff bantering in the conference room, and it's just really well done. I'm gonna give it a four out of five. As for the jump episode, I don't think I've ever understood the coherent story behind season six at all. Like, and I'm gonna talk about that more during the season six wrap up, but why this affair storyline took hold and ate this much screen time, I don't really know. I don't think it's bad. I don't, I don't think it's amazing. It's just there. He don't give an F about nothing. Nonetheless, this episode is pretty great. There's four written reviews on this episode on IMDb. Each of them are eight out of 10 reviews. Again, I love Office fans. This dude loved the cold opening and he said the rest of this episode is all right. Nothing too spectacular or mind blowing. Eight out of 10. Like two away from the absolute highest score that can be received for any created motion picture content ever. Eight out of 10 for an episode that is fine. I love Office fans. Anyway, I'm gonna disagree with this guy to an extent. I think there's a lot of great stuff in this episode. The use of pacing. Hey everyone. No, no out, out. Right leave now. now. The timing of the jokes. Go on baby, go on the drama nested within the comedy. I think it's a really well-written, directed, and edited episode with one real flaw. Michael Scott? Yes? Do you want to make a comment on the rumors? <sighs> um... Yeah, I don't really like this right turn the episode makes right here. There hasn't been a mention of the printer episode since the cover-up, and I think that it might have been able to be finessed a little better. I mean, it's possible that Andy's motives in this episode embolden him to not be a chump and get the word out. S spoiler, I guess. I didn't want houses and schools to burn down and children to die. But it always feels jarring after such a dramatic moment. And not in like a super funny way, although I think I've misread this joke my entire life. I apologize to the coach and the players. I vow to never listen to my bodily instincts ever again. We cannot let the pedophile win again. But I won't fault the episode too much for that. They didn't need to come up with a segue to go into the finale, which is gonna be next week. But overall, I give the chump four out of five. I am Beyonce always. It, not this time. Yes, I am. All right, so if you're still here, I'm gonna need some help with something. Two weeks from now, we're gonna be rolling out the season six finale or the season six wrap up episode. So if you wanna help me with some content for that, get in touch with me on the Discord, links in the description. But thanks for everyone who supports the channel. Check out how you can support in the description of this video. Uh, leave a comment on what you think about the chump. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. You can dream it, you can live it, buddy. You're not even enjoying it. It's not about the enjoyment. It's about... <laughs>